everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vital Descent. I'm your host, as always, Patrick McFarlane. This one is episode 256, and the show notes may be found at vitaldescent.com forward slash 256. And uh, on the line, I have a new guest to the show, Clay Hudson. How's it going, Clay? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm doing well. Hope you're doing the same. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you, you just did an interview with Scott Spaulding, a friend of the show and frequent guest uh, on why I am anti-war. And um, you, do you just want to introduce yourself? I don't want to butcher, you know, your, your background or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, Scott's a great dude. I had a, a great time on that podcast. And shortly after that, I also went on um, Embrace the Suck, How I Embrace the Suck podcast. And that was another another great chat. Um, all good dudes. Uh, quick background on me. So I was born and raised in small town, Illinois. I grew up surrounded on three sides by cornfields and the fourth side was a cow pasture. Uh, very isolated, conservative Christian, red area, you know. Um, I enlisted when I was 17 into the Illinois National Guard did the college ROTC route while simultaneously drilling with my National Guard unit. And when I graduated, when I got my bachelor's degree, I commissioned as a lieutenant into the Army Reserves. And through that, I got sent to flight school. So I went to flight school um, around 2018, left qualified on the, uh, the Black Hawk. And so my Army Reserve unit was in Conroe, just north of Houston, Texas, which is where I uh, live and work now. And um, recently got out of the military, which is a, a long and interesting story, which I'm sure we're going to get into. Yeah, and I, I think maybe, um, I like I told you before we started recording, I listened to your episode with Scott, and um, I I don't want to like replicate it as much as you know, if right. as much as we don't need to, but to to kind of go in your history, I know that your history is similar to mine, which is not similar to Scott's, so. Like, um, I grew up, I mean, I'm, I wasn't in the military, but um, I grew up in a conservative rural area, too. It's like there's two cornfields in a forest and then cows <laughs> yeah. over here. Um, so, <laughs> like, growing up, what what uh, denomination were you? Uh, pretty much non-denominational Protestant. Okay. The whole time. That's, yeah, so... Mine was uh, the English Lutheran Church, which is a bit more like liberal than the Wells Church. Um, so, but did like was I know you have uh, you have two brothers, right? And they're you're all in the were in the military at least. Yeah, I have I have two older brothers, and there's like a ten year gap between us. That's just my my parents were were odd that way. There's one there's a group of older kids, and then a group of younger siblings. Um, and my two older brothers enlisted when I was in like second or third grade, something like that. So I grew up seeing them in the military in uniforms. You know, it was like we made a family vacation out of going to military graduation ceremonies. And the very first one, I think I was in third grade. We went to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, watched my brother graduate. And then, you know, we spent a couple of days on the beach. And then after that, my second oldest brother graduated from... Uh, the intelligence course at Fort Huachuca. So we made you know, a real long road trip from Illinois to, to Arizona and, you know, saw the sites along the way. It was always a, like a family activity. So the military for me has always been a part of my family in a big way. Yeah. And it seems to me like there's just from talking to vets, you know, through the show and through my stuff, it seems like it's either people who have like a strong family history of the military that end up joining as like a legacy thing or yeah. at being raised in that culture, or you have, it seems like first timers, maybe for them, it might be more for, I don't know, for educational purposes or the opportunity or something like that. Is that kind of your experience being in the service? Yeah. yeah. When, when I joined, there were three big reasons. And like we were just talking about the, the, the family heritage of it, that was big. And I, I mean, I remember it was, it was later on in my brother's military career. They, they were deployed a couple of years um, after getting out of basic training. And uh, my, my second oldest brother, he mobilized out of Fort Hood. And we made the trip down to, to say goodbye. And we, we did the same thing for my oldest brother. And both of them had deployed uh, to Iraq at least once. And then uh, my second oldest brother has been to Afghanistan. 
And man, I just remember those those moments. I like I knew that they were putting themselves in danger. And I remember just oddly feeling like almost jealous of them because I knew people saw them as like heroes, which thinking back on it now with, you know, a 28 year old mindset rather than a, than a, than a fifth grade mindset, that just seems crazy to me. Like, how could I be jealous of someone who is leaving their family, leaving their kids, you know, for a year upwards or longer. And they were deploying, you know, in the, the mid 2000s, something around like 2007, I think it was. And, you know, that was a pretty hot time in the Middle East. So they were in le legit danger. They were, were most likely going to see some sort of combat. And yeah, thinking about it now, it's crazy that I was almost jealous of them. But you know what? That's that's what the propaganda does. It makes you want to be a part of a, a system that can turn you into you know, a hero in the eyes of your, of your community. It's, it's all so romanticized that the, the really, the, the dirty, harsh reality of it is just, we can't, we don't realize it. And for you, I'm trying to think of where to go with this because like in the show, we've been talking in the last couple episodes about anti-war cinema yeah, and, I love that episode. That was really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and and I think I mean, did that play into it at all with you? Or was it was it films or even with your older brothers? I mean, did uh, are your parents in the military or grandparents or anything like that? Um, both of my grandpas were briefly in the military, but I don't think either of them saw any significant action, and they were only in for you know, like one contract stint, so like three three or four years maybe, um, and. It, it was it, in big part, it, I, thinking back on it, it had a lot to do with the movies and the video games because the movies it, and, and especially the video games make it seem fun, make it seem adventurous. I played a lot of Medal of Honor growing up on the PlayStation 2. Same. You know, my brothers had that game and there's just something about it that it the, the, the characters in both the video games and the movies and my brothers in my mind, they were characters that had an extreme amount of physicality to them. They were disciplined. I think the word for it is they were elite. They were part of an elite group and, you know, therefore they were elite individuals. And something about that just really appealed to me. I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to be pushed so that I could become, a, you know, what, what could be considered an elite individual. And I remember thinking a lot that I really wanted to be self-sufficient. And I had this weird idea, and I, it's hard to really pin down where it comes from, that the military will make you self-sufficient, which is not true. Um, you know, the military is one big socialist program, basically. So it, it hasn't, it is far from being self-sufficient. Everything is provided for you. Um, it's, it's literally the exact opposite. And, but, but somehow, and I'm, I, I guess it's just the movies, when you watch those movies like Saving Private Ryan, where they're walking through the wilderness, and they have nothing to depend on but each other and and their skills that they've been trained to do. To me, that I guess that looked like self sufficiency, which is really attractive. Yeah, and I think that's why you know part of their recruiting slogan is like "Be all that you can be," right? Yeah. Is, is that the Marines or is that the Army? I always get it confused, but I think it's the Army. Yeah. Yeah, and I think so. Even after I joined kind of this libertarian space in law school. <laughs> There was a there was like a JAG officer that would come and visit the school to do some recruiting, and there was a brief period of time. I think I've talked about it on the show where I was considering it, even when I had been part of this world in knowing all the things that I know. And I, I think part of it was like, you know, I could go to basic and get all these awesome skills, and I'd get to shoot guns, which I love to do, and you know stuff like that. But of course, that's such a naive, romanticized idea of exactly what it is and what you're doing and committing to. Yeah, a hundred percent. And your, your episode about anti-war cinema really got my, my wheels turning. We're like reinvigorated, reinvigorated this idea that, that I've had for a while about doing anti-war stuff through, through fiction, through fiction works. And, you know, I was, I, I, I have like an outline created for a book that I would really like to follow through on someday, but it, it would be, a book focused on, 
you know, kids, probably boys around like the third or fifth grade age. And all I would do with it is dispel a lot of those myths that, <laughs> that were fed uh, from the time we understand English, uh, from the time we can speak, all these myths that were fed. And because I had a lot of same ideas about basic training. I'm going to go to basic training. I'm going to get super fit. I'm going to shoot guns. I'm going to learn all of these, the, these skills that will help me survive out in the wilderness. I mean, next to none of that happened. I got to shoot, but it didn't turn me into a skilled shooter. We exercised, but I didn't leave as some, you know, super. When I got there, I re that that's really when I realized that the military is not an elite organization because there are so many other people that were out of shape or were just like really undisciplined. We're constantly getting in trouble. A lot of people, especially during the height of uh, the wars in the Middle East, like uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. A lot of people were getting waivers for, for prison time, like felons could get waivers to join the military. And so a lot of times the, the people in the military are, are, are criminals. And, you know, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not trying to sit here and, and hate on criminals. You know, they're still people. But it's just it was not a reflection of this idea that I had what the military was. And so I, I would really like to, to, to create some, 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 fictional, some, some fictional books just focused on dispelling some of those myths, just creating stories that reflect my experience uh, in, in basic training and in my unit and on my deployment. It, it just to get rid of these I, these ideas that make kids think the military is cool. And I, I think one of the cool things about um, working with fiction is in drawing on your real world experience to create it is that truth is stranger than fiction. They say that sometimes. And it's true because sometimes these events that happen are just like, um, I was reading this, I think I referenced this book that I was reading in that anti-war cinema episode. Um, and I don't think I have it right on, but it was, it was a study of killing in war. Right. And it's not the, not the, oh. um, not the Ranger one. It's a different one. This Joanna Burke that I was referencing. Okay. And there's so many testimonies there in journal entries from from combat veterans. And some of the things that they talk about happening, you couldn't recreate just from someone's fevered mind, you know, like, uh, you know, collection of body parts by soldiers. And one thing I really turned like keyed into is, you know, in Vietnam, there were stories of taking VCs and, and setting their dead corpses up at like a, a tea table. And um, having tea with them or something like that. I mean, just yeah. you couldn't make that up, really. Right. Yeah. Um, I've. I, I, it's, it's on pause right now, but I'm working on it on a book that is a collection of some of the the most horrific stories that I've read in in war memoirs from World War One to present day. And I would really like to get try to start collecting stories on Ukraine. Um, that, that'll be tough, but I think it would be worthwhile. But I, I've, I've focused mostly uh, recently on, on World War I. And yeah, the, the dead bodies is an overarching theme across every single memoir that I've read relating to World War I. Every single one of them, on like every other page almost, they mention the dead bodies that are just always lying around. And a big thing about World War I that was really disgusting and, and really hard to fathom is they just didn't, they didn't have time or the room or the energy to properly bury them. So most of the bodies, if they were buried at all, were buried in shallow graves, which meant that if a mine exploded or a shell hit anywhere near your position, you're going to be hit with body parts. Um, some are going to be older than others, of course. And so there was a um, one story in a memoir by Philip Gibbs, who is a British war correspondent, he wrote an amazing memoir called Now It Can Be Told. And it's I, I got the inspiration for a blog that I run called Code of Words on Substack. And in that, he tells a story of British soldiers at the Battle of Hoog, which I can't remember. It was a part of a, of a bigger battle. I can't remember which one. But it was just – it was uniquely horrific for British soldiers. And that's where he talks about that sort of thing. He was like, yeah, shells would hit, and you would look up, and you'd be hit by mushy bo body parts because they were in these shallow graves. They've been decaying for a certain amount of time. And that's just, it's, it's discussing stuff like that that gets buried in history. It's not shown in the movies. 
And I'm I'm kind of I'm working on a little project right now that I really need to devote more time to as well. But it's like um, I think at the the climax of the story when the character really changes or reveals themselves, they're gonna cut the ear off of a dead soldier that they just killed. And I think like it creates a weird juxtaposition where where the character was at the beginning of the story and then what the climax is. And I because anyways, but I think it I think it works pretty well. But it's always a challenge to for me because I, I went to um undergrad in undergrad my focus was creative writing. And for yeah. me, it's always a challenge to how can I tell an interesting story that is character driven while also maintaining a principled message that is the underlying, you know, strength of the story. And it's, it's hard to do that. Um, and I think it takes practice, which, you know, practice takes time and time takes, you know, availability. <laughs> and something none of us have. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you and I could talk about fiction work quite a bit. I'm super interested in that. Um, I got, I got a business degree and I only got into writing a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm a content writer full time now, which of course is not, is not fiction, but that's kind of, I do quite a bit of that in my free time. Um, and yeah, I, I think about a lot of the same things. Like how do you create these super compelling characters that can subtly teach you a lesson and normalize things that aren't usually normalized. And, and that, and that's hard to do. And like, how do you, how do you tell a story through the character and the way they express themselves, not necessarily like, and then this happened, which taught this character this, like you can't, you know, that's not, that's not how you write, you know, a novel or something like that. It has to be expressed through the character's experience. And it's hard to do. You're right. I think, I think it just takes repetition. That's what I've heard is a lot of writers that their, their first few books, they look back on them and they're really disappointed or embarrassed by them, but eventually they get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's um I, I like it too because you know when you when you really feel like you're writing a story a good story you feel like you're discovering it and not that you're creating yeah. it but that it was it was something that existed apart from yourself that you spent the time digging up or or yeah. um yeah but I go, I mean in in going back to your own progression and your history uh do do your brothers I'm just curious do your brothers have the same view about the military that you do now. Um, no, it's, it's definitely not as radical as where I'm at. My second oldest brother, he's libertarian leaning. I, I, I don't think he's as, as far leaning as I am. And my oldest brother, I don't think I've ever really had much of a conversation with him about this, but I mean, growing up in a Christian conservative household, I think, I think we're all naturally a little skeptical of the government, but it's, <laughs> but that's, it's only the Democrats, right? The, the Democrats are the demons, not the Republicans. Right. The Republicans are the one that are, that are going to, you know, make us a, a Christian nation again, it, th those sort of tropes. And I, I don't want to speak for them too much, but I have had a, a couple conversations with my second oldest brother and he was actually a character witness for me while I was submitting my, my conscious objector application, which we, we can talk about more. And he was a character witness for me because years before I had even submitted the application to be separated, we had talked about kind of where my views were in terms of the government and more specifically foreign policy. And I mean, that, that was, those were hard conversations to have because I had reached a point when I, it's hard to justify anything that American foreign policy does, it's, you know, especially when you take like a real broad view and you're painting with, with, with broad strokes. Of course, there are circumstances of, of good things resulting uh, from American foreign policy and, and you know, uh, American troops doing good things. There are, of course, stories like that. But in the end, is it a net positive? In my opinion, no. And that's been my opinion for some time now. And it's, it certainly is in illustrious ranks of, um, you know, conscientious objectors that you're joining in terms of, uh, I mean, the first thing that I really think of are, are the conchies from like World War I, especially in Great Britain. Um, and I, I wanted to do, at, there was a time when I wanted to do uh, kind of like a, a documentary focus on them, but 
there were whole prisons full of people who refused to go to war at all or have any kind of detail. Do you do you know offhand like how many conscientious objectors there are in the U.S. military that apply in like any given year? It's it's very small. The the Pentagon hasn't published much information on that in recent years. The the best I was able to find are numbers from 2007. And, you know, even back then when, when things were pretty hot in the Middle East, they were approving about 50 percent of applications. And I think they numbered just over a thousand. So okay. pretty low. Um, but, yeah, it is a very, a very painful history for conscientious objectors. And I, I'm not super familiar with it. I've, I've started reading up on it and I, and I want to write more about it. But for the vast majority of history, up until Vietnam, because it, I believe it was in the 70s that a lot of uh, federal regulations came down that, you know, created certain protections for, for conscious objectors. And, and since then, things have been much better for us. But prior to that, almost all conscious objectors were are imprisoned, tortured, and basically exiled from their community as, as cowards. One story that comes to mind uh, was uh, an African American named Robert Simmons, who refused to fight in World War One. Uh, he was from Georgia. They arrested him in Georgia and sentenced sentenced him to prison in Alcatraz. So he went from Georgia to Alcatraz, and while he was there, they kept him in a pitch black cell without the ability to sit or even turn around. So it's about as tight as you can imagine, basically just a little closet. Um, and they would keep him there for days at a time. And that, that's torture, of course. Uh, and they kept him in Alcatraz in conditions like that for over a year after World War I ended, just out of spite. And there's, there's countless stories like that. I don't think the history is as well documented as it could be. Um, so who knows how many people have endured that, that same sort of punishment simply because they don't want to go fight and kill in war. Yeah, and I I want to I want to drill in more to your story in a second, but you know, as long as we're talking about the history and kind of media, did you see uh Hacksaw Ridge at all? Yeah, that was originally how I even heard about conscious objection in the first place. They don't talk about it in the military. Yeah, interesting. Well, I and so I haven't actually watched it because I think it's some I st- I attempted to, but then like there was, you know how war movies now they have like a bunch of CGI, and I I'm a yeah. practical effects guy, and I just got turned off, and I didn't like um, you know who's uh Vince Vince Vaughn? He's supposed to be a libertarian, right? Yeah. And I think he he starred in that movie. But did you do you have any like thoughts about? I know the main character is a medic, and you had in your interview with Scott, you differentiated between the two different kinds of conscientious objectors. Um, yeah. So can you, I guess, can you describe the two different kinds and then kind of relate it to the movie? Yeah. So there, the, the two types are you can either um, request transfer into non-combat arms, in which case you won't have to carry a weapon. Uh, and then the other type is you can request discharge, which of course means you're out of the military entirely. I got out of the military entirely. That was my request. I decided that I no longer want anything to do with the with the U.S. military, so I've, I've disassociated from that um, pretty much entirely. Uh, and Hacksaw Ridge, I watched that, and I the, the, it has a lot of merits, I think, because the the main character was, if I'm remembering correctly, he was a pacifist, and his issue was he was not willing to carry a weapon, he was not willing to physically harm anyone, and he wanted to, in fact, do the opposite. So that's why he became a medic. So you know, he deployed uh, to the Pacific Theater and saw all sorts of horrible things, but he did a lot of good. And, you know, that kind of brings me to like a uh, an interesting conversation that is kind of like within the, the, the Christian community. And it's like the question of can Christians be in the military, which is a, a question that the church has been dealing with for centuries. I mean, literally since the church was first established in, in the first century, they've been dealing with this question. Um and, you know, personally, I, I think that Christians can be in the military. And I think this because e- even as a conscientious objector um, who sought separation, which when you seek separation, 
that means that you are opposed to war of all forms. If you don't seek separation, you don't have to meet that legal definition. You just don't want to bear arms, essentially. That, that's all that means. But if you seek separation, you are opposed to war of all forms, even war of self-defense, which is where I find myself now. And it's simply because I don't think war can ever be a solution for anything. I think that the, the costs always outweigh the benefits. That, that's my opinion. That is not everyone's opinion, of course. It's not every Christian's opinion. And wh where I found myself on, on this topic is I just try to judge everyone by their own individual actions. And so a Christian can be in the military and based on their own individual actions, still be a good Bible-believing, Bible-adhering Christian. But it it does depend on your actions. If you consider yourself a Christian and you're asked to do something in the military that is not Christ-like, and you say yes to it and you do it, in my eyes, that's a sin. And that, you know, you have to deal with that in however you deal with it. The, the, the Bible says repent. So whatever that would mean for you, you know, that, that's what that's what you got to do biblically. But if you're a Christian in the military and you're ordered to do something that is not Christ-like, even if you don't consider yourself a conscious objector, you can say no. You're going to have to deal with the consequences, but you can say no. So, and a lot of it has to do, in, in my mind, with the way you serve. I always say that I'm not proud that I served, but I'm proud of the way that I served. And that's because I like to think that just the way that I treated, you know, the other soldiers around me, that I, I made a positive impact while I was in the military. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a conversation that, that I've had with my brother as well, because he's like, well, do you think that I'm not a Christian because I'm in the military? I'm like, no, based, it all depends on your individual actions. And I'm sure that the way you've served has made a positive Christian impact on those that, that you serve with. Yeah, you always get into this, I don't know, for me, it's, um, at times it's an uncomfortable situation because people, maybe people who venerate the military feel like you, you can't judge members of the military because you haven't done it yourself and that it's unfair right. therefore. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm not someone who's in favor of being a hypercritical judge of other people, of judging other people. But at the same time, it is difficult to have this, you know, passionate anti-war stance and also try to grapple with, you know, people who yeah. may participate in a Christ-like manner and serve in a Christ-like manner in an unjust war. Or, you know, even yeah. people who serve in an unjust war who don't serve in a Christ-like manner. So it is it is kind of difficult and it's something that I've kind of grappled with through the show over the years. But uh, Yeah. I'm, I mean, you know, everybody has a different conceptualization of what the military's purpose is. And I think I I think that you could make a case that you could be in the military and be a nonviolent person. And again, it, it just all comes down to your individual actions. You could refuse to go on, you know, wh whatever example you want to think of. You could refuse to assault a building in, in Fallujah. You could outright tell your command, no, you're going to have to deal with the consequences, but it's possible. Um, and I, 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 I have no room to judge anybody, especially Christians, that are still in the military because that was me at one point. I fell victim to what I view as extremely powerful propaganda. And how could, you know, how could I blame them for that when I was victim to it myself? You know, we, people, especially in, in, in our circle, people that consider themselves libertarians, we, we have this like libertarian moment where it feels like the blinders come off and you see the world for what it is. You can't manufacture that. It has to happen, you know? And so I, I, I can't be upset with people if they haven't had that moment. It's up to me to try to convince them. If anything, I should be upset at myself because I'm not good enough at convincing them. <laughs> yeah, and I think at the point where I eventually came to it is like, well, you know, these these things are going to happen in the world whether I morally condemn them or not, you know? Yeah. And so you have to look inward and be like, well, am I the type of person that is going to be, how, how do I heal this situation in the best way that I can? And it's not, right. I mean, for me, it was, you know, at some point when I got really radical, I was saying, you know, all the soldiers are bad. They're baby killers, whatever. And that was like a brief time in maybe 2018. But I think now it's just like, well, 
even someone who has been participating in war, what is the best thing interaction I could have with that person is probably listening and not saying anything, you know? Yeah, exactly. Persuasion cannot happen unless you first listen to their position. Because with, unless you understand their position, you're not even going to know where to start. Right. Yeah. Welcome to the portion of the show where I tell you how you can help support this content. The best way to do that, guys, is to go to libertyweekly.club. Yes, I haven't changed the URL yet, but this is my membership website that also functions as a newsletter. So if you go to that website, libertyweekly.club, hit the subscribe button in the upper right hand corner and you can subscribe for the free newsletter. And I send out a lot of free content. However, there is a section in those free emails that is premium and that premium section includes early access to my episodes, access to bonus episodes, and preprints of my articles before they're published at the Libertarian Institute or other outlets. So again, go to the website, hit subscribe in the top right hand corner and sign up for that email list. You go through the page here and you can see all the content that I've set out in the past. There's a whole bunch of it, guys, and you get access to those previous emails that have gone out as well. Another way to help support me is to go to liberty or excuse me, vitaldescent.com forward slash stitch fix and sign up through my link there. You'll get $25 off your first order and I will also get a $25 credit. Guys, I use this to buy my wardrobe. I'm a, I'm a father of two. I have my own business. I do this and I don't have time to go shopping. Can't haul the wife and kids around to have a leisurely shop for myself to pick these clothes. So what Stitch Fix does is that they pick the clothes for you, they send them to you in fixes, and uh, it's really awesome stuff. These are all the pieces that I personally have bought myself. Uh, there's a lot of work stuff in there, but there's also casual stuff. I got an awesome, awesome uh, uh, plaid shirt that's in there, a flannel, really love that. I got this really cool sweatshirt. I got these awesome boots and a nice windbreaker, really good stuff. So go on over to vitaldescent.com forward slash Stitch, stitch fix you can also get Lib or vital descent really hard not to say liberty weekly vital descent merchandise with the cool awesome new logo from mises pieces you can get all these kinds of things all this merch you got coffee cups pint glasses sweatshirts premium t-shirts premium sweatshirts all that good stuff there at vitaldescent.com forward slash merch also guys i started a tiktok channel and I think that'll be really cool trying to get more eyeballs on this content and more views. You can see it's um, already garnering a bunch of views where I do anti-war cartoon reviews and a lot of cool stuff there. So vitaldescent.com forward slash TikTok is where you can find me. My handle is at Pat McFarlane underscore the same as my Twitter handle. Okay, guys, that's about it. Check out those things. Please help support this content. Help me pay my producer and uh, make the show better for you guys. Thanks. And, and through talking with vets, you know, too, it, you kind of like, like with Scott, I was like, okay, well, being someone who has never had this experience, but wanting to hear about it and wanting to help and to heal, how do you even approach these stories, you know, with, with vets? Yeah. And he's like, well, the best way is just to ask them what they did. And they'll tell you what they want to tell you and they won't what they don't. And I guess that makes perfect sense. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. Some people, of course, are, are more willing to talk about things than, than other people are. I, I wish that stories of the, the really heartbreaking stuff was was more out in the public domain, because I think that that is where veteran stories can, can make a difference. And because th there's like this archetype of like the Jocko Willinks where they come out of the military and now they're these leadership experts and they got their leadership expertise through the military and the, the tough stuff that they did in the military. And sometimes that can include stories of violence that they may or may not be proud of. But I rarely ever hear stories of stuff like I had to shoot a 12 year old because they were carrying a weapon and pointing a weapon at me. But those are the stories that like solicit tears and really tug on the heartstrings. And it's stories of, and there, there was a video on, on Twitter. It's stories of like when people become mentally crippled 
because of the things that they saw or because of the things that they had to do. We've all heard constantly over the last few years of the, the epidemic of PTSD. But I mean, how, how often do you hear the stories of the aftermath? You, we, we hear the stories of the suicide and that's the extent of it. That's like how it ends. Like they go to war, they get PTSD and they kill themselves. That's the extent of it. We need to hear the stories of the in-between of when they were battling with the VA and they were endlessly frustrated with the VA because they couldn't get the help that they needed. And I saw a video on Twitter of this dude who was breaking down on camera because he had just like cycled through his third therapist that, that he was assigned through the VA. And he was like, I'm sick and tired of having to talk about these war stories over and over again, just to get the therapist caught up. And it's stuff like that, that I wish was more out in the public domain. Uh, that's just, that is the only example I can think of, of, of something like that. And, you know, I heard, I, I read a, a statistic the other day, I was reading through a, a VA report. Let me see if I can find it on my Twitter. It's stuff like this, that, that just is, is hidden in the internet. Let me, uh, let me scroll and find it, but it has to do with some, some publicly available data from the VA on like their, 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 their ratings and how many people receive what type of rating. Um, is it like these, these, you know, for just roughly speaking, like these Google review ratings, you know, where if you like customer feedback kind of things, no, no, no. Like a, like a VA disability rating. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That's what I'm Sorry, talking about. I, so yeah. yeah, I found my tweet. So in it, I said the U S war machine has mentally crippled more than a quarter million people to the point they can barely function. And again, all of this is publicly available data. The, the VA has published all this. Um, so according to the VA, 55%, about 310,000 troops of all 100% disability ratings awarded by the VA. And if you're not familiar with how the VA works, their, their ratings range from zero to hundred percent in increments of 10. And it's always rounded to the nearest 10. So, um, hundred, uh, so 55% of all 100% disability ratings awarded by the VA, which the, the VA throughout its history of all ratings it's ever awarded has awarded about 570,000, 100% ratings, um, are for mental disorders. So about 310,000 troops have received a 100% disability rating for a mental disorder. And that could be PTSD or it could be depression or a myriad of other conditions. Um, and that's just approved claims. It doesn't include anyone who's been denied because the VA denies people all the time for good or bad reasons. And it doesn't include vets who haven't filed because they were either um, too lazy to do it, couldn't figure it out, whatever the reason was. And But the, the big takeaway here is if a veteran is awarded 100% disability, they are in many ways unable to function on a daily basis. If you're awarded 100% disability for, say, a, a back condition that causes back pain, it is really hard for you to get out of bed in the morning. That's like that's the extent of it. And so if you get a 100% disability rating for, say, PTSD, you cannot function on a day-to-day -day basis it likely means you can't maintain work or relationships. And you, you know how much a 100% VA disability rating gets you? 3,600 bucks a month. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. So more than a quarter million people have been mentally crippled to the point they ma can't maintain work or relationships. But and that that's due to American foreign policy. I'm just trying to In see. So that's $43,200 per year. Yep. Yeah. So it's a little bit more if you have dependents, but even then, I don't think right. it's to my to my knowledge, it's not possible to get above like four thousand dollars a month. So, I mean, just just imagine that doesn't really solve many problems for you. Of course, it depends on how you live, but right and and, and how good you are at saving. But that doesn't really solve your problem. That's not enough money, especially. You know, with the, the, the crazy inflation we've, we've seen recently, you can barely pay your bills. You right. can't, you can barely send your kids to school on that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking what you going back to Hacksaw Ridge too. Oh, are you, are you there? Sorry. Um, yes, I, I think it disconnected for a second. Um, going back to Hacksaw Ridge, maybe I unfairly, cause 
it, I talked about it in my anti-war cinema episode, but maybe I unfairly characterized the story because I started it and then like I didn't like it and so I stopped watching it. Um, but I, I'm not completely familiar with the exact story here, but I guess my my way of looking at it was like, okay, well you're gonna you're gonna go and you're gonna serve in the war, and I guess what your your role is is to heal people who are fighting, but in a way that's still aiding the war effort. And if it's, yeah. you know, um, if it's an unjust war, then, you know, maybe your actions are morally, in a way, morally condemnable because you're patching somebody up who is then going to be able to continue fighting and killing. Mm. Yeah. Um, that is, that's a really, I think that's a good and valid argument. I just don't think it's that black and white. You're right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, especially especially today like in world war ii maybe because yeah the, the the character in hacksaw ridge he he might have legitimately healed somebody who went out the next day and killed someone like that's very possible and that, that's possible today as well but warfare today is is mostly like counterinsurgency warfare is is uh, of course not the same way that we fought in world war two and world war one where it was the, the this near peer like especially world war one open field warfare it's, it's just not the same so i it, i think that would be a little bit tougher argument to to make today like me i was a black hawk pilot and so could you make an argument that if i were to be a part of an aerosol and i drop some infantry men on the ground to go and raid a building and they kill someone. Am I also responsible for that? In a roundabout way, you could make an argument for it, um, but it's, it's a little bit it's a little bit tougher. I, I mean, that that's a hard conversation to have. Yeah, it is. Sorry, and i I thought it would, I thought it, that point would be a little bit more related to what we were talking about. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but um, no, it's it's just it, it is so difficult to kind of grapple with this human cost, right? And I yeah. think the way it does relate is just this idea of moral injury, you know, you, I've talked about it on the show before, like, um, you know, having people who are s such a large part of them are having these, these m mental dis disabilities like that. And it really seems like it's a hidden epidemic and the difficulty, like you had mentioned before of having someone who has established care with three different therapists and has to now find a new therapist and digging up that wound for a fourth time yeah. to try and excise it in a way. Uh, it's just, it's shocking. I mean, to be so riddled with emotional problems that yeah. you have a hundred percent disability. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's, it is crazy. The effect that a uniform has on the way that we see things, because if you were to reframe that and say it was just, you know, if, if it was a girl who was sexually assaulted, I feel like we, we could think about it in, in totally different ways. Like, yeah, of course, uh, if a girl is sexually assaulted to the point where she has to go to therapy to work through the PTSD, she gets nothing but sympathy from everyone. But for some reason, because a veteran volunteered and because they wore a uniform and participated in what could be considered an unjust war, they lose sympathy. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like they didn't, they didn't ask for it. Right. Yeah. It, it, it also seems like, you know, you're a part of this culture of machismo where, you know, you're supposed to be strong and tough. And if you have misgivings about it, then maybe you're a pansy or something like that. Yeah. I mean, despite everything and, and maybe you can opine on this too, because the, the standard role now from conservatives is that the military is woke and that they're <laughs> all, you know, but I, I think that's just, it rings hollow to me. It's just a talking point because what they do their jobs and what is their job? Well, it's, you know, if the drone operator killed a family and you were mentioning it in, in, um, in Afghanistan and Kabul in Kabul in the last few days, uh, that drone strike that killed six or seven kids and their father coming home from work, who was an aid worker who yeah. employed by a U.S. nonprofit. So, Which is the only reason never made it into the media anyways is because he was I'm an sure. aid worker. I'm so he sure. had connections. Yeah, I'm sure. So yeah. there, there's that disconnect between, you know, the public perception of and, – and, but I mean, 
I guess just to even address it in the first place, do you have experience with wokeness in the military that defined the culture of the military? No, the, the, the culture of the military, in my experience, is not woke. I, I mean, how do you even define that to begin with? I, I guess loosely you could say, is the, is the military progressive? I, I, I don't think that the individuals in the military are mostly progressive. Most people who are in the military come from conservative backgrounds. Um, are there woke policies? I, you could you could probably say so. I mean, there was a, a few years back. I, I think it's still in place. Um, in my mind, is is a surgery, and if you. If, if, if it, it qualifies under uh, under um, you know Tricare as a covered surgery, then why would I have a beef with it? The, the money's being spent regardless. So sure, I'm sorry. I, you, I, you, you, yeah, you, I don't really. The internet. I, I don't pay much attention to that sort of stuff. Sorry, the internet cut you out there. You had you were you you came out when you were talking about the procedure. Was it is it a sex change procedure that you're talking about or? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's still covered under TRICARE that the military TRICARE will, will, will pay for a transition. Oh, okay. Which in, in my mind, it's like, well, if it's covered under TRICARE, I mean, the money's being spent regardless. So why would I have a, have a beef with it? You know, sure. it doesn't, doesn't really affect my life. And overall, I haven't really thought too much about wokeness in the military. I, I don't give it much attention because I agree with you. I think it's just a talking point. Yeah, and I, I think it, it really detracts from the the underlying premise of that entire point is like, okay, it describes the army as being ineffectual, effeminate, pansies, not capable of doing their job. Okay, okay. well, what's the solution to that? The begged solution um, or the problem reaction solution is, well, the military needs more money. It needs more funding. It needs better mm -hmm. personnel. It needs to be more effective at what its job is, which right now is is provoking confrontation with nuclear powers. Right. <laughs> That's essentially what they're what they're advocating. You're right. So even though even though I, I uh, greatly respect Colonel Douglas McGregor because you you will he hear him say and you know as he talks that the military is woke and stuff like that. But again, he's a military man, and he although I think. His argument would be that, well, we need a more efficient military to do yeah. reasonable things that are within our purview, uh, which is not provoking war with nuclear power. So yeah. I'll take it. I'll take yeah, it. Yeah, I, I do. I do agree with that 100 percent. I think the military is extremely inefficient. There is so much waste that could be cut, you know, not only in arms production and arms contracts. Um, and that's that's, you know, that's DOD more broadly. But it, it, from what I saw, from what I witnessed in the military, it's essentially a jobs program. There are a lot of people in the military who are horrible at their jobs, not only enlisted, but officers as well. There's so much toxic leadership and it's nearly impossible to get them out of the military and stuff like that leads to a lot of inefficiency. More broadly, the military hasn't had a defined mission for years, for two decades now. Um, that leads to inefficiency because you're just trying to find ways to spend the money, you know, rather than just having a very pointed objective, it's go sit in the Middle East for 20 years. You know, that's not a pointed objective. And so, of course, money is going to be wasted. Um, and I, I agree to an extent that the military is is pretty ineffectual in a lot of ways. But I think that's primarily um, caused by just normal turnover. There are there are fewer and fewer combat veterans in the military every year as they retire and as we continue to conduct military operations in kind of this this peace setting. You know, even though we are intervening, we see less and less combat every year, especially in the Middle East. And so every year there's just fewer combat veterans. And for a military to really pack a punch, you've got to have those those real hardcore guys that are willing to just grit their teeth and go and go kick indoors. I don't want them to do that, but if you're trying to build an efficient military, those are the kind of people you need. It's not like the, there are so many more administrators in the military than there are, um, you know, 
the 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 door kickers like the i don't know exactly what the ratio is but it's it's certainly not a whack most militaries are that enable the you know the, the logistic chains but there is a certain proportion that you try to look for and the united states is certainly out of whack on that yeah and i i think too about you know, the arguments from Colonel Douglas McGregor specifically when I've heard him talk about, you know, the army being ineffective and woke and not ready to meet its challenges. I think it, it's the compelling case, because if you're arguing to people who are pro-military, I think the compelling argument is, OK, well, you don't have to be a libertarian and think that, you know, we should defend the U.S. with a couple good subs like like uh, Ron Paul says. But but at least to say, well, this is the real concern, right, is that we're not spending our money wisely. Our weapon systems are, first of all, they're not plentiful enough. Second of all, they don't achieve what they need to do. Um, you know, we have the F-35 that doesn't work. We have, you know, we don't have hypersonic missiles. We have a chips problem. We have toilet seats that cost 30 grand, you know. Um, so yeah. it seems like why don't. Why don't we fix that and have a more manageable mission at the very least? And I think you can get conservatives on board with that. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of conservatives, especially conservatives, have a huge problem with how Biden handled the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yeah. First of all, there was no good way to handle that withdrawal. The, the best the best plan to get out of Afghanistan was to never go there in the first place. <laughs> right. And there was no good way to do it. You just have to rip the Band-Aid. I, I, I mean, can't. Oh, I'm sorry, Clay. Go ahead. There's. Every place the military, the United States military has ever been, we've left billions of dollars of equipment behind. It's not just Afghanistan. People have this idea that Biden did that on purpose for some nefarious reason. That's so stupid. They do it everywhere. We did it initially, like prior to the second surge in Iraq, which was under Obama, right? Like they, they did it before that as well. There were generators, millions of dollars worth of generators and tents and temporary buildings and weapons and vehicles left behind. I mean, that, that's how ISIS got their hands on them. It always has negative effects, but it always happens. You know, so it's like to blame Biden and say that he shouldn't have left Afghanistan. I hate it when conservatives say that sort of thing. In my mind, the same thing needs to happen in Iraq right now. There's no good way to do it. You just got to rip the Band-Aid off. And once you get there, once you leave an area of operations that has consumed our time and energy and mental bandwidth for 20 plus years, only then can you start to narrow the focus of the U S military. And I think, um, to, to your point on Afghanistan, it, it has become like in a way worrisome because people that I'll talk to who never, ever cared about Afghanistan, never talked about it, nothing who are conservatives, will just reflexively say, oh, it was such a bad thing. It was a disaster. You know, we, we fought 20 years to make sure that little girls can go to school in Afghanistan. And now the Taliban is back in control and Biden sucks. And like uh, those dogs they left behind too. And you have people mm -hmm. hanging off of airplanes and stuff. And Dave DeCamp makes such a good point because I always, you know, Afghanistan was never my expertise, but he said, I think the withdrawal went incredible because what happened? The, the puppet government, yeah, we spent 20 years propping them up, but they surrendered in a week or two without many shots being fired, yeah. without a prolonged. I mean, think about the worst case scenario um, would be that, you know, the Taliban starts a war with the ANA that we tried to train for so long. More people, civilians die, and the war goes on in perpetuity for years and ravages that country. I mean, would, yeah. do conservatives prefer that that happen? They, they, they probably do, just to save face for the U.S. And if that were if that was to have happened, the, the, the media would never have talked about it. So, you know, no one would have been the wiser. But I, 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 totally, I totally agree with that point. It could have been handled better. Everything could always be handled better. But also, people do not understand the scope of U.S. military operations. Like, it is so incredibly hard to get anything done in the military. And to get it done right is, like, near miraculous. It's it's so hard to do anything, to, especially if you're trying to change something. 
Um, if you're trying to change the status quo, good luck. But of course, Afghanistan, the withdrawal could have been handled better. But yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with that point. If if the the Afghanistan government that the U.S. propped up and trained and funded had been um, competent, it would have resulted in a civil war, which would have been much worse for the people of Afghanistan than Taliban rule. Of course, Taliban rule is horrible and oppressive, but it's better than being it's, it's better than dying. <laughs> right. In my opinion. Yeah. And and making making this decision for these these people like, no, little girl, you want to go to school. And you want democratic values or else, you know, and we're going to make this decision to prop up a government that, you know, oh, OK, well, they might let you go to school, but they also rape little boys. Like, which which one do you want? You know, um, and making right. that decision for them. Uh, you know, I've always I've also grappled with this issue, though, of, you know, people who support Ukraine and criticize libertarians for always pointing out the 2014 Maidan coup. They they will try to point out that the U.S. that or at least that me making that point is condescending and denies Ukrainian agency. In in that, I assume that it was an you know like an NED overthrow when I'm denying agency of the Ukrainian people. But it just sure there were a lot of people there. And I'm sorry to kind of get on my soapbox, but like, sure, there were a lot of people there who were part of the protest who were legitimately aggrieved parties, but yeah. that doesn't mean that they would have overthrown the government absent U.S. support. I mean, think about all the money and logistics that it takes to keep people in Maidan Square for days, yeah. you know? Yeah, pe people don't understand, like, an idea is not enough. <laughs> right. The idea was was amplified because of U.S. support. Yeah. And so what we got about six or seven minutes left here and I, I failed to bring up and return because we, you know, we've just been been going with some good rapport here, but to bring up your story of what really changed your mind. And, and I'll put a link in the show notes page to your interview with Scott. I don't know. Did you duplicate kind of did you tell that same story on the uh, the Embrace the Suck podcast? Yeah, I, I think I did a better job on Embrace the Suck, though. I, I went in a little bit more in depth, and we talked a little bit of church history, which is okay. really interesting to me. Um, but yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to briefly tell the story here, and then talk about some of my like, you know, anti-war activism objectives, and you know, how I think about that sort of stuff in general. But like I said earlier, I enlisted in in 2013. I was 17 at the time, and I was super gung ho. Let's go get the Taliban. Um, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. You know, I bit all the lines of propaganda and I was super ignorant and arrogant as a 17 year old, I'm, as I'm sure most of them are. But I went to basic training um, and it was it was in college. I had a friend in my Illinois National Guard unit. Um, he was he was a platoon leader at the time. Uh, shout out to Tom if he's listening. And he really exposed me to, to libertarian thought. Prior, prior to meeting Tom and, and talking politics with him, I was just a regular old Ben Shapiro guy, so I, which is super embarrassing to say now, but it's, it is what it is. Um, but he introduced me to, to guys like Tom Woods and, and Dave Smith and, and Thaddeus Russell. And I just like, I went down that rabbit hole. I listened to all the, the, the Tom Woods episodes, all the Thaddeus Russell episodes. Um, and so I originally, I had a shift politically and it was maybe like 2017, about as right as I was about to graduate college, I had a political shift to an anti-war perspective. And at the time, I was just like, these wars are extremely wasteful. It was just a utilitarian perspective. Like, why are we spending all this money and getting nothing out of it? It wasn't it wasn't all that principled. And then, but then a couple of years later, I came across a theologian and, and pastor named Greg Boyd, and he exposed me to a different way of seeing the U.S. government and violence in general through – like he, he shifted – it was a paradigm shift for me listening to him speak about these things. It just totally changed my mind on the, the, the use of violence. And he, he preached this sermon series called Twisted Scripture that I stumbled upon on YouTube. One of the best sermon series ever preached in my mind. He, it's so good. And he is one specifically on Matthew 22, which is the story of, uh, of Jesus being approached by the Pharisees 
And they're like, should we pay taxes? Should we not pay taxes? And he says, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Um, that, that verse has been extremely mis, misinterpreted over the centuries, as with Romans 13. Romans 13 has been used by the Western church to justify all sorts of, of government actions, it, for, again, for centuries. And he, in this sermon series, he offers an alternative interpretation, which th- there's, a, there's a lot of other theologians that, that agree with him as well. But essentially, uh, the, the Romans 13 reinterpretation that Greg Boyd offers is, when, when, in Romans 13, when it says God establishes the authorities, when he establishes governments, it more closely means orders, meaning that he uses them as he finds them. And what that means for Christians today is, insofar as, as governments are being Christ-like and passing Christian laws, we should obey those because if we're behaving like Christian anyways, like, like Christians, we're, we're going to be acting in accordance with those laws regardless. You know, there doesn't even necessarily have to be a law, but we should obey that. Um, but insofar as they're not Christ-like, we should not obey them. We should um, fight them, not violently, but we should resist them. And you have to see it that way. Otherwise, if you just blanket interpret Romans 13 as all authority comes from God, all governments come from God, now you're stuck making some sort of justification for Hitler, right? Which does not sit right with me. I I cannot accept that. You you find yourself saying that Hitler was put in power by God. Unacceptable to me. Um, And so I I had this, this shift in my faith and in my politics and I was deployed in 2022, and I, I, I had a couple of experiences that just really further soured me on the military in general um, during that deployment. Uh, we, we had a brief one night. I, I remember this like it was yesterday. It was a uh, it was a battle captain brief, and it was on the our, our um, incoming ROEs, which are rules of engagement for anybody who doesn't know. And the rules of engagement are derived from what's called the law of armed conflict. And in that brief, we were told that the law of armed conflict, and this is something that I didn't know before. I'd never been told before. The law of armed conflict does not prohibit incidental death to civilians so long as the expected military gain is greater than the civilian loss, either life or property. And to me, I was like, how can the government claim to have the ability to determine that some that a mil- some vague military gain is greater than someone's life. To me, they don't. Um, and that's because I believe, you know, all life has value and, and comes from God. So how can a government claim the ability to, <laughs> to essentially sacrifice someone for their ends? To me, that is like next to evil. Um, and you, you and had- there, was, there was another experience where I had a buddy who had some death in, in, in his family and he was trying to get sent on emergency leave in my deployment, reserve pilots, reserve officers, we kind of get stuck with, with desk duty. So I sat at a desk in Kuwait the whole time, and so did my friend. He was an officer as well. It was not an important mission. We all knew that. We all knew we were going to just sit there and do something that was not important. And even though he had a death in the family, because it wasn't an immediately an immediate family member, which is what the criteria is to be released on emergency leave, because it was an immediate family member, his, his emergency leave was denied and it caused a lot of fallout in his family. And I just, I never understood why command couldn't take some discretion and grant him the emergency leave because we all know that we were just gonna go sit in Kuwait. So, and he would have been back in time anyways, but it was just a follow the rules no matter what mindset is in the military right now. I, I, it's, it's one of my pet peeves. Officers in the military are rarely, if ever, willing to get between the system and their soldiers to the benefit of their soldiers. They rarely ever do that. Everyone is scared of having the, of having the book thrown at them, which of course will happen. But if you're going to be a leader, you have to be willing to deal with that sort of stuff. And that was, that was another thing. I just, I I can't be a part, I don't want to be a part of an organization that is so dysfunctional in that way. And so I submitted my conscious objection um, application in December of, of 2021 and it was approved November 2022. And I was finally separated in March of 23, which, you know, kind of brings us to, to present day. A couple points. I, I think um, when you talked about the, the ROEs, it was, you know, civilian deaths don't matter as long as the expected military output 
is better. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. It, that's as such long a as you subjective can make a justification. You will be free and clear, which is why we see all of these drone bombs, drone bombings gone wrong. There's no repercussions because they have a justification spun up already that the military gain was going to be greater than incidental civilian deaths. Yeah. Yeah. The in in they could be mistaken in that expected, you know, yep. military gain. Yeah. Um, we just saw that we just saw that the other day. There was a farmer in I think it was eastern Syria. Um, they launched a drone strike on this guy that they thought was some high value target. He was limping out. No, no, that's a different story. He was he stepped outside of his house. They launched a drone strike, killed him. And then reports came out from from local like social media sources that it was just a farmer. It was not their intended high value target. And now the Pentagon is conducting an investigation to see to to, to just confirm that it was not their target. So if they if they can't prove that he wasn't their target now, it was that he was their target now. They couldn't prove it before they launched the strike. But that didn't matter. It went forward anyways. That reminds me of, I don't know if it was some kind of Ukrainian, like Ukrainian war propaganda where they were criticizing Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, Russia or somebody of doing like a double tap strike or something like that. And, and it's just so hypocritical. And I wish I could remember exactly what I saw that made me think of this. But I know for a fact that the drone operators, they do double tap strikes, right? Like it's a, a delayed strike. You strike first and then you wait a couple minutes for all the EMS to arrive or, you know, for people to arrive and then you hit it again. Um, the Intercept reported on that, uh, that that's what happens with the drone strikes. The, the other thing is... Um, you had mentioned your friend who was denied personal leave. That just that reminds me of uh, Band of Brothers, and I think it was episode one or two where Captain's. Have you seen Band of Brothers? Yeah, it was, yeah, it's a good show. Where Captain Sobel, they're about to embark, you know, upon the Normandy invasion, and they all have been trained since uh, Kurahi by Captain Sobel, and Captain Sobel is this. He's a good. He was good at tra training the soldiers, but he's inept in a combat situation and he was going to get everyone killed. But so many of the NCOs decided to boycott it and they put a letter to, right. I, I don't know if it was the general or whatever it was saying that they yeah, it was their, the brigade commander. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know the rankings as, as well yeah. as you do. Um, yeah. But what, that's exactly what you had mentioned is that it seems like the, the leaders are, unable or unwilling to put themselves between the system and their soldiers to the benefit of their soldiers. Yeah. It rarely ever happens. Um, I can't think of any examples from my time in the military, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I, I don't think I was ever put in that situation. So I never had to make that, that type of decision. Um, but you, you had mentioned that we're, we're coming up on time. I, I, I do have a, a spiel that I like to go through um, at some point when, when I talk to people and it's just about my anti-war thoughts and my anti-war objectives. Um, so when it comes to my anti-war activism, you know, I, I, I'm trying to get more involved in that sort of stuff. I'm really trying to get in with, uh, the defend the guard movement. I've done a little bit of phone banking, but that, that's about the extent of it. But eventually I'm going to, I hope to kind of, you know, make a name for myself in, in, in that sphere. Um, but my anti-war activism kind of rests on a few premises. And I think that these can appeal to anybody. I think they're just super simple. And I think anybody can use them. When you're having conversations with people and you're talking about war, um, you can use these things. And number one, we should all be anti-war simply because of how agonizing war is for people who live through it. And all you got to do is listen to veterans. Go listen to Why I'm Anti-War podcast to hear those stories. Um, read some some war memoirs to, to hear some of just the – the agonizing stories, it, it's horrible for everybody that lives through it. Uh, number two, I, I believe that the GWAT was a fluke. Um, I, throughout the, the, the last 20 years, we've seen, including uh, contractors, we, we've had under 8,000 casualties, I think. That is absolutely unprecedented. And it is, it is an exception to the rule. And we are seeing that it is an exception to the rule in Ukraine right now. The atrocities of World War I and World War II 
in Vietnam and Korea can and unfortunately most likely will be repeated. Warfare is not always going to look like the GWAT. People need to understand that. Um, and that. And that is why it is so essential. We just take a step back and breathe when it comes to China. We do not want to continue down this road that we are on with China. It will not end well for anyone. Near peer conflicts should be avoided at all costs. All you got to do is look at Ukraine right now. It's a modern day example. Um, and third, war is not a necessary evil. War is just evil. War does not solve any problems. Even if you are declared victorious in a war, what do the people who lost their lives get out of it? What do the families of those people who lost their lives get out of it? They're dead now. They get nothing out of it. And I can guarantee you, if you go ask those families, which would they rather have? Like, take, take some crazy hypothetical that we're invaded by China tomorrow. Would, would a mother and or a sister or, or a daughter would they rather have the ability to live under a Joseph Biden regime or would they rather have their, their husbands, sons and brothers? You know, so to me, war can never be a solution. And because of that, anti-war has to be a matter of principle, meaning that there is no justification that anybody should be able to give you that convinces you to support war. You, we have to put our foot down and no matter how, how good their rationale is, the media, the, the lawyers, the politicians, they're always going to be able to spin up some rationale that seems to justify the next war. But it is never worth it. The cons always outweigh the pros, in my opinion. And you know, through those premises and through my anti-war activism, I hope to achieve just a few things. And these are simple goals for everybody. Um, convince at least one person to be anti-war. If I can do that through my anti-war activism, uh, and through my writing and through podcasts like this, you know, goal achieved. I love that. Two would be better, but I'll settle with one. Um, and with, politically speaking, I really hope to convince people to, at the very least, reconsider voting for someone, for voting for a politician who advocates military action as a solution to our problems. Because again, it, it's not. Um, and then lastly, the, the most difficult one that we've touched on a little bit and hopefully, you know, you and I can finally find the time to to sit down and, and work on some anti-war fiction, um, because it's it's stuff like that that is going to change the culture, which is something we have to do. We have to find a way to make war a social taboo in the same way that uh, racism or public nudity or smoking while pregnant is a social taboo. People should in, just instinctively turn their nose up at the idea of going to war as they would those other things. Um, so those are those are the things I'm fighting for. Yeah, you know, war is bad and everything, and I agree with that, all that stuff. But you know, this war, this war exactly. is different. Every time, every yeah. time. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, where can people follow you and your work, man? Um, I'm on Twitter at claybert32, um, and then my blog is codeofwords.substack.com. I'm way behind on that. Um, but through those two channels, you'll, you'll see me tweet, you'll see me argue with people and eventually you'll, you'll see links to the, the books that I publish at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right on. Thanks for coming on. And, um, I know there's so much more to unpack and yeah. I'm sorry we only uh, on a cursory level got to your, uh, your conscientious objector history, but, um, there's more to explore there. And then I, yeah, I'll link people. Part two. Yeah. Part two. Uh, but I'll, I'll also link people to the interviews that you've already done, uh, going into more detail on that. So, um, awesome. all right. Well, thanks a lot. We'll, uh, we'll catch you later, man. Cool. See ya. Thank you. Bye.